everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IAIA webinar. Um, perhaps just before we start, we might allow 30 seconds for our attendees to join, and then we'll go ahead with the program. Fine. I hope most of you have managed to, um, to click into our webinar. As I say, welcome to you all again. Um, my name is Mari Cross, and uh, this event is part of our Future of the EU27 project, which is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and is jointly organized with the European Commission representation in Ireland. And we're delighted to be joined today by the European Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights, Nicholas Schmidt, who has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak to us on the theme of social policy for a sustainable and fair recovery. And just a few practical points. Commissioner Schmidt will speak to us for about 15 minutes or so, and then we will go into a question and answer with our audience. Uh, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions uh, on written, in written form throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once Commissioner Schmidt has finished his presentation. It would be useful if you could give us your names and affiliations attached to your questions. And a reminder that today's presentation and question and answer are both on the record. And uh, please feel free to join uh, using the Twitter handle at IIEA. And we're also live streaming this morning's discussion. So a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us on, on YouTube. Now to introduce the commissioner to you, um, Dr. Nicholas Schmidt, who is from Luxembourg, uh, took office as commissioner for jobs and social rights in December 2019. And prior to this, he served as a member of the European Parliament. And from 2009 to 2018, Commissioner Schmidt was Minister for Labour and Employment in the government of Luxembourg. This appointment followed a long career in Luxembourg's public service, including roles as Minister Delegate for Foreign Affairs and Immigration and Permanent Representative of Luxembourg to the EU Commission. As you will see from his, his experience, he is very well qualified for his commission post. Uh, Commissioner Schmidt was given a very significant agenda uh, by President von der Leyen when he was appointed in December 2019. In six short months, however, he is now in the front line of leading a recovery from the corona pandemic which has engulfed us all. So Commissioner Schmidt, we look forward very much to your presentation uh, at this most important time and the floor is yours. So again, Thank you very much for uh, this invitation. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to be your, your guest speaker uh, this morning. Uh, and um, I, I'm, I must say we are in a very special uh, moment because uh, uh, we face a, a big challenge. How uh, does Europe manage uh, to come out of this crisis, which was an absolutely unpredictable crisis, uh, quite different from the crisis we experienced uh, uh, a few years ago and which uh, in, impacted uh, Ireland uh, quite uh, dramatically. And so uh, it's a crisis uh, which has affected all member states. There is no member state which has not been affected. First, uh, in the, from a sanitary point of view, uh, though there are differences, the impact is not even, it's not equal. Some member states have been affected much more on that uh, level than others. But uh, economically and socially, uh, the impact is huge. In terms of uh, GDP, the, we have got uh, the last forecast uh, a few days ago, uh, European GDP under uh, relatively optimistic uh, uh, assumptions will drop by more than 7% and uh, unemployment will go up uh, close to 10% and we are coming from something like uh, 7 points, uh, 6 point seven, uh, going up again uh, close to 10. So this shows uh, how deep, how sharp and how rapid uh, this uh, crisis has uh, changed our overall environment. And you mentioned that uh, when this commission started, 
uh, I was um, I was given the responsibility for uh, for jobs and social. In a meeting we had yesterday with the uh, with the whole college, I said, as a job commissioner, I was in a rather favorable position because uh, during the last before the crisis, during the last month, uh, unemployment dropped all all over Europe, and uh, we uh, achieved we attained uh, the highest level ever of employed people in uh, in Europe. And from one moment to another, this picture has changed dramatically. Uh, and this is uh, what we have to deal with now uh, on, the, on the recovery side. Now, what has been done first? I think uh, there are a lot of uh, comments saying, well, Europe has not done enough, or where is Europe? First, I would say everybody in Europe has been very much surprised. Uh, by uh, the outbreak of this crisis. And it was quite, at the beginning, quite difficult uh, to measure the impact uh, and the dimension also on the health side of this crisis. I remember, I recall just that even the, wealth, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, World Health Organization at the beginning was not sure if uh, 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 this uh, would uh, turn into a a pandemic or if it was just something uh, quite uh, similar to a normal flu. Well, then uh, everybody uh, looked uh, to China and uh, the first information we got from China was not, were not uh, so alarming. And uh, then things happened quite uh, fast. And we, 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 we noticed that uh, no country really was prepared to the to this kind of crisis. But then Europe uh, reacted very fast. First, we made sure that uh, we mobilized the funding uh, which member states can uh, rely on. So we adopted uh, regulations giving member states to draw on the, uh, uh, the funds, the cohesion funds, the, the remaining funds, um, and uh, to use it as uh, uh, in, in, the best, in the best way they consider to fight uh, the impact of the crisis. So these two regulations uh, on, in the framework of a, a corona uh, uh, investment uh, instrument were adopted very, very promptly and very fast. A second measure we took was to uh, try to keep borders open. And that was not an easy task because we noticed that the first reaction of member states was to close borders. And this was really threaten, threatening the internal market because uh, we discovered what finally, uh, uh, what kind of achievement we had through opening the borders or at least uh, uh, um, having the Schengen Agreement uh, uh, on the continent and that uh, uh, there were no border controls anymore. Suddenly there were border controls and uh, we, uh, uh, discovered what we had finally uh, the advantage of uh, no border controls. Here we tried to keep borders more or less open, was not totally achieved, but at least we tried to get borders open for, uh, for uh, goods and for those uh, workers, cross-border workers who uh, work in very important, crucial uh, strategic, I would say, sectors, like the health sector, for instance, that these people could uh, cross the borders. So this was a second uh, important uh, element. The third one was uh, in the perspective of um, uh, um, reopening progressively and especially restarting uh, companies uh, and, um, and the economy. And this was uh, uh, health and safety, uh, because uh, you cannot tell people to go back to work if they have not uh, a minimum of uh, guarantee that this happens uh, in a in a in a safe way. That means that people can rely on all kinds of safety measures in order not to be infected. So we issued uh, a certain number of guidelines which should be respected in the context of. Uh, uh, health and safety. This was done by uh, our agency in Bilbao and uh, we really pushed for 
uh, uh, for the respect and the implementation of these guidelines. I just, uh, an hour ago, I had an exchange with one of the uh, 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 board members of Volkswagen, and uh, he told me that this was a crucial moment in order to reopen the activities in this company, really to give people the uh, guarantee that the working place is a safe place, that the working place is not a place where people risk to be infected. So we have to continue working on this uh, uh, very, uh, very actively. And the last point I want to mention is um, finally uh, the, the change in, in the working ways, because uh, I've also seen that uh, hundreds of thousands of people in, in Ireland have uh, stopped working, either because uh, they lost their job or uh, they are in short time. And here we uh, just today, I, I got the information just now, uh, Coropea adopted our instrument uh, financing short-time work. Uh, we have about 40 million people presently on short-time work in Europe. So this is uh, very much the case in industry. This is very much the case in uh, a lot of services, especially also a, a sector which has been very has been very much affected is tourism. Here, the Commission adopted uh, communication two days ago how we can relaunch progressively also the touristic activity. And I know that Ireland is is quite a tourist country, also relying very much on on uh, on visitors, on tourists. So we have to make uh, sure that first uh, tourism restart. And second, that uh, people traveling uh, get also all the uh, uh, guarantees that they can do that in a safe uh, uh, context. So here also, we have to make uh, sure that uh, um, uh, um, uh, health and safety is uh, respected. But coming back to SURE, so we have uh, now an instrument uh, giving uh, member states the possibility to draw on 100 billion euros to finance short time. Uh, schemes, uh, 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 which is of high importance because when we are looking uh, to the US, for instance, we had an increase by 20 million unemployed people in one or two weeks. Well, this didn't really happen the same way in Europe. Certainly, we had an increase in unemployment and we will ha still have an increase in unemployment, but this unemployment surge was not as dramatic, as high as, uh, for instance, in the US because. Uh, uh, practically all the member states use this short time work, which allows them to keep their people, to keep the skills of their people, and uh, to prepare the recovery. And that's, that's my uh, next point, the recovery. Now, uh, recovery means that uh, certainly a lot of uh, measures have already been taken uh, by member states. Um, but uh, these measures are quite uneven. Uh, those member states who have uh, a lot of uh, financial or budgetary margin, well, have uh, uh, taken measures up to four, five, and even above uh, um, uh, uh, supports to their companies, uh, and uh, so allow their companies to survive. Because one of the biggest issue in this crisis is uh, because we, have, we are facing a supply uh, crisis and uh, at the same time a, de a demand crisis. And the first step we have really to do is to preserve our supplies. That means we have to preserve companies uh, because uh, even uh, very uh, healthy companies are threatened because uh, in many areas the lockdown has finally um, uh, cut them off from their normal clients because people could not consume, people could not by cars, people could not uh, normally um, uh, um, uh, have their their normal uh, uh, living, and this has uh, had uh, this had a tremendous impact on many sectors, industrial sectors, service sectors. I I mentioned uh, tourism, hospitality, and so the the first objective was uh, to uh, try to save uh, our uh, the majority of our companies because. Uh, a company is dying, uh, it will be even much more difficult to have a rapid and, uh, and, uh, and strong recovery. So this is a, an important point. But 
uh, unfortunately, not every uh, member state had the, the same means to do so. We have quite big differences between uh, member states uh, in, the, in, uh, in the measures they took to support their, uh, their uh, companies. Well, we opened, by the way, uh, the rules of state aid, so we gave the member states a, a large margin to support their companies because uh, otherwise the companies would not have have the right to become beneficiary of state aid so we finally uh, uh, changed that and uh, but it was important it's now important to have to come back to some level playing field because what is at stake in that context is the uh, uh, the the internal market because if you have companies who got a lot of money to uh, to support them and other in other member states the uh, they do not get the same amount because the member state has not the financial margin to do so. This will have an important impact on the internal market. Same thing for employment, by the way. And uh, the uh, other aspect is uh, uh, we have uh, to make sure that this economic crisis is not transformed into a social crisis. And here, uh, fighting unemployment is key. I mentioned short-time work, but uh, we have really to take into account uh, special vulnerable cat categories of people who are really uh, suffering or risk to suffer most uh, from this crisis. And uh, here, uh, young people, uh, youth unemployment is really an issue. Uh, and I noticed that, for instance, in, in Ireland, you have a, a very sharp surge in uh, youth unemployment. And this happens in many other countries, especially in those countries where we had already uh, still a high level of uh, youth unemployment. So uh, we, uh, we are working on that in the framework of the recovery plan. Now, what should be the recovery plan? Uh, it's difficult for me at this stage to give too many and too precise indications. But uh, during the, the meeting we had yesterday among commissioners, it was clear that the recovery plan has, uh, has to be sizable. Uh, because this is also part of the credibility of Europe. Uh, it's part of making, uh, working on the level playing field, which is important in social terms, but especially also in economic terms. Uh, so having a sizable recovery plan coming from Europe. I won't give any figure, but uh, when we talk about sizable, we mean that it uh, has to at least have a certain percentage of uh, European uh, GDP. The second one is it has to be timely. Uh, so we cannot wait uh, months um, before really implementing this uh, recovery plan. So uh, because uh, our economies are suffering, unemployment is going up. So we really have to implement this recovery plan in a very uh, short term way. So that's why a decision now in the forthcoming weeks is so important. And third, it has to be well targeted. It has to help companies to survive. It has to really sustain a rapid uh, relaunch of our economy. We have to kickstart the economy on the supply side as well as on the, uh, on the demand side. We have to make sure that uh, people come back to their jobs, that they will find back their jobs. And in order to make sure that they uh, will find a job, we have to make first sure that companies survive and that companies have trust in the future because companies who do not trust, uh, who do not have any trust in the future will not invest and will not create new jobs or even uh, maintain the existing jobs. So uh, now targeted means also that we will not encourage our economies to come back to the pre-crisis system. If we invest billions of uh, euros, uh, we want also these billions of euros to have uh, uh, an impact on the transformation of our economy. This commission has uh, had two big priorities and still has two big priorities. The first one is the greening of our economy. Climate change remains a major, uh, a major issue. Uh, this has not changed uh, due to uh, the corona crisis. Uh, climate change remains with us. So greening the economy, investing in uh, reducing CO2, two emissions remains uh, uh, our priority. And I think we can use this recovery plan to help companies to adapt 
to change uh, and uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to green their production processes overall. That's the first one. So this is very important, and I think through that we can also uh, create new jobs because the green economy has different jobs, but there is the possibility of major creation of jobs. And the second aspect, uh, the second priority of this commission is the digital aspect. So uh, in order to make Europe uh, to 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 make Europe competitive in the global economy, we have uh, we ha we really have to be leaders in uh, the digital transformation, in the technological transformation. So uh, uh, Vice President Vestager is very much working on that, but this has also consequences, social consequences, and uh, consequences for, for employment. As I told you, I, I just had an exchange with one of the, uh, uh, the biggest European car, uh, car manufacturer, and what I got from them was to say, well, uh, certainly, there will be a big transformation in employment. Uh, there will be also some jobs lost. Uh, but first, the, the qualification, the competences of our people have, have to be changed. So this is, for, for, for me, the biggest challenge is skills. So this, uh, if we want to come out of this crisis, if we want to really um, make the transformation green and digital successful for everybody, if we do not want people to, leave, uh, to be left behind, we have to invest a lot in uh, skills, reskilling and upskilling. And that's why we are working on a new skills agenda. I want to uh, organize also a big skills pact uh, with uh, the European business, uh, in, involving also social partners in order really to launch and to reinforce, to strengthen uh, uh, the investment in, 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 in skills, because that's the future of jobs. That's the future also for young people. Uh, we, we will revamp the youth guarantee and part of this uh, relaunching or strengthening of the youth guarantee will uh, very much uh, rely on uh, pushing uh, the digital skills for young people. So uh, companies, member states, regions, schools have to really uh, adapt to this uh, major uh, technological uh, revolution. And my last point is we have to keep an eye on those who are the real victims of this crisis, because uh, uh, still we had a, a high portion of people in Europe uh, under the threat of poverty, the risk of poverty. We have not uh, achieved our goals uh, of the 2010-2020 uh, objective reducing uh, the number of poor people in Europe by 20 million. We had started to reduce it slightly, but now the crisis uh, may have changed this again. And therefore, uh, when I look what happens in many member states, those people who have been on precarious jobs, those people who have been self-employed, uh, those who have, uh, many women have lost their job uh, in uh, service sectors like uh, hospitality, restaurants, and tourism. Well, many of them have no income or very small income. So the poverty issue in Europe has come back to our, fully come back to our agenda. So we have really to work on this. Uh, how can we uh, support? Uh, how can we make sure that uh, uh, we have not a growing portion of people uh, uh, falling into the poverty trap uh, and, and not being able to come out. So uh, we have to start to uh, the discussion around a minimum income. Unfortunately, some, well, fortunately, some member states have minimum income schemes, but we have to make sure that in all member states, we have some kind of a, a, a minimum uh, income framework. And that's what uh, we will do especially also on the German presidency where the Germans have announced that they want to do that. We have also to make sure that, and that was uh, what the president of the commission announced, we have to, to make sure that uh, pay still, uh, work still pays. Uh, working on the minimum wage, I know that in Ireland, the minimum wage is the second highest, I think, in Europe. So it's not Ireland, which is so much uh, uh, targeted, but other member states where the minimum wages do not allow uh, a normal uh, 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 life in dignity. So this will go on. We will still work on that. 
and I think wages, by the way, uh, of uh, portions of our, uh, of our working force have to be reviewed. We have seen that a lot of jobs, uh, which we did not uh, consider so much, or at least uh, we did not appreciate the social value so much. When we think about nurses, all the people in the care, in the care sector, very often in many member states not being really paid so well. Uh, I think we have to look at this differently after this crisis. And therefore, it's important to have uh, 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 new social standards, in encouraging collective bargaining also for these categories of people, very many uh, being women, because 70% of the whole care sector and health sector are women. And very often we see that, well, because the sector is uh, very female, the wages are low, or because the, you do not know exactly the relationship with, with both. So uh, e uh, gender equality remains also a very important issue, also in this crisis, because women have been in those sectors the most affected and the most crucial, like the health sector or the care sector, or even retail sector. So we have also to have a look at that uh, to get uh, 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 gender equality accelerated. Therefore, pay transparency, for instance, is a very important issue. We will continue, my colleague, uh, Commissioner Dali, uh, uh, will continue on that. So these are uh, the, some aspects uh, how uh, the Commission will work uh, uh, mainly on the economic and the social side. For us, it's very clear and that the recovery has to have a very strong social input, a social dimension as we considered that uh, the social dimension under this commission had to be reinforced. We have the, uh, uh, the um, pillar of social rights, and I've been charged by the president of the commission to work on an uh, uh, implementation plan, an action plan for the, uh, uh, for the uh, pillar of social rights. This remains on our agenda. We will present this action plan beginning of next year, uh, we are discussing with the Portuguese presidency how uh, we will push for this uh, 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 action plan and they have the intention to organize a, a, a summit on, on the social uh, dimension in the period of crisis and of big transitions. So uh, uh, social remains uh, as one of our priorities because we know that uh, uh, social is crucial uh, for, for the cohesion of Europe, for the cohesion of the, our societies, and for uh, the support Europe uh, has among its citizens. I stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Commissioner, for that comprehensive overview of what the EU is doing. And uh, we can see um, uh, the, the commitment uh, to try to deal with the, uh, this pandemic and the crisis it has caused across all areas. We have a number of questions um, uh, which um, uh, I will put to you. Uh, the first one is from Paul Ginelli uh, of the European Anti-Poverty Network. Now, I think you have spoken about poverty and how to deal with it uh, much in your, um, in your talk, but I will put you Paul's question. He says, thank you, Commissioner, for your presentation. What measures will the EU take to ensure we do not enter a new phase of austerity policy in the wake of the crisis, and particularly to ensure we do not see any increase in poverty as happened during the last crisis? Specifically in relation to social protection, how will the EU move to ensure all member states have minimum income schemes that provide accessible and adequate supports to those who need them? Uh, I'll leave, uh, give you that question, Commissioner. I, I, I par partially have already uh, answered it, answered, but uh, yes. I, I, I fully agree that uh, we have, uh, and I think there is a, a strong will of this commission, uh, not uh, uh, to copy what was done after the last crisis. Mm. I think the solution certainly is not now to say, well, uh, now we have to come out of this crisis and uh, uh, the way how to do it is austerity. So I think we have, uh, we, we have learned a lesson in a way also because there's a political dimension, a very strong political dimension in that. Uh, what to do is first, uh, we have to make sure that uh, social protection is a right for everybody. So social protection also for workers who are in atypical working uh, statutes, 
the, the platform workers, uh, the, those young people who are on very precarious uh, working uh, statutes or labor statutes, uh, we, we have to make sure that everybody gets uh, a normal social protection, meaning above all also health, uh, health insurance. So this is something we, uh, we have started as a recommendation adopted under the previous uh, commission. It's only a recommendation, unfortunately, but we have the intention to work on that and to uh, adopt uh, by next year uh, uh, a more uh, compulsory uh, framework for social protection for everybody, access to social protection for everybody, uh, especially for those who are not in normal uh, working uh, conditions. The second is uh, certainly uh, the emergency, because a lot of people uh, rely now on food banks, which is in a way in a rich, on a rich, in a rich continent, something which is not very normal. But I've seen that in many places, uh, in, in the, even in the richer parts of Europe, people uh, really need the food banks. Otherwise, they cannot afford any anymore buying food for, for themselves and their children. So we, we have to respond to this emergency. And we have this instrument of, uh, of the, uh, uh, for, for this fiat fund for, for the people, the most deprived people. So we have to, to mobilize enough resources to support this. But this is an emergency, emergency situation. This is just to help people to, to, uh, to come more or less uh, uh, through, uh, to go through this uh, crisis. But uh, certainly uh, we have to make sure that uh, uh, less people rely uh, on this uh, uh, food bank. Homelessness is another issue which uh, probably will increase. We have about 700,000 homeless people in Europe. So my uh, discussion is how can we reduce this? How can we really establish the right for, uh, for housing for everybody? Now, we, we have good examples. Finland is certainly one of a good example uh, uh, with, with quite, uh, very positive results. So we will organize next year a, a big conference with all kinds of sto stakeholders, with uh, also NGOs, how we can improve uh, our policies in the member states uh, to reduce the numbers of homelessness. And then you have mentioned it, and I have mentioned it, uh, a framework for uh, a minimum income. I think we need this because crises like this, we cannot exclude that they, they come back. And uh, uh, having people who have, from one day to another have no income at all. We have made sure through uh, uh, short time work that uh, workers maintain uh, a certain level of their income. But there are people who do not have any income, who do not get any unemployment benefit. And so it's important for, uh, uh, for having this scheme and we will work on it. And I hope that uh, unfortunately it comes a bit late, uh, but that we will have all over Europe a scheme and a framework for minimum income. So uh, my last point is, yes, we need uh, uh, resources. And there are discussions also in, in, the, in the framework of the recovery plan to mobilize enough resources to make all these policies uh, 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 at least uh, have a strong participation of uh, the EU in the implementation of these policies, including also at a financial level. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And I think for the next question, you have almost uh, answered it, but it is from Mike Allen, Director of Ag Advocacy, Advocacy Focus Ireland. And he refers to um, Finland, as you did, saying every country in Europe has experienced rising homelessness and the, the, that is likely to increase. And he mentioned that the Commission has limited confidence in this area, but could play a much more active role in shaping and guiding national best practice. Uh, and strategies, and does the Commissioner have any proposals in this regard? I think you have mostly mentioned the proposals you have, but you may have an additional comment you want to make. I think it, uh, we, we are in a way, and I think the crisis are pushing, uh, has pushed us in, in that direction, that more people are aware of this, uh, uh, this extreme form of uh, social exclusion. Uh, now in every city we, we we meet people who are just living in the streets they have no social guarantee whatsoever and uh, they have a big health problem because they cannot just stay at home because they they do not have a home and therefore uh, we really want to uh, i know that the commission has not very important uh, competences in this area but we thanks by the way to ireland we have in the treaty this 
chapter on fighting ex social exclusion. That was a request I remember very well of Ireland at that time when the treaty, I think uh, during the Amsterdam negotiation. So we, uh, homelessness is a form of exclusion and we have uh, the, the possibility to better coordinate uh, member states in their policies and also through different financial means to support these policies. So this will be done. We, will, we, we are about to start it. Uh, uh, I had uh, two days ago um, uh, uh, an exchange with uh, one of the NGOs, which is very active on homelessness, how we can proceed, how we can put also in place uh, a European fr framework uh, to fight uh, homelessness on building, uh, by building on, uh, on good experiences. I mentioned uh, Finland as one, there are a few others. So this is something which is on our, our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, our next question is, for, is from Juan Menendez Valdez, who is the executive director of Eurofound, the EU agency based in Dublin, who, as we know, has just produced um, statistics about the COVID uh, and, and the views of people in member states, which has been uh, uh, a shock, I think, to everybody. The, the, uh, um, the feeling of hopelessness and depression that it has uh, exposed in many areas. He asks, in Eurofound, we're collecting measures taken at national level. A number of them refer to income support, like basic income schemes. Some are suggesting a European approach to such schemes. Is it realistic to expect some new common action in this field, he asks, maybe complementing initiatives on minimum wages? Well, I, in a way, I have already given also an answer. I think we, we, uh, um, we will uh, start uh, working on the idea of a framework for minimum income in Europe. Uh, this is uh, an important point on the program, on the German presidency's program. And uh, in my um, discussions with the German minister, uh, Minister Heil, uh, they will put that on, on, on their agenda of their presidency. And we will work together how we can uh, uh, really create uh, the basis for uh, a, a, a framework, a European framework for uh, minimum income. Now, uh, I am not a, absolutely convinced by unconditional minimal, minimum income. I've seen that uh, in Finland, they, have, uh, they had this pilot project. I've read the, the, the uh, evaluation. Well, there are some positive points. There are some points which do not allow us to conclude very clearly. But what is important is that people should get uh, the possibility if they cannot work, if they are in a position where they have no income, that uh, they get uh, a, a, a minimum income. They can uh, live uh, in, uh, in dignity. And this, has, this is not just a national measure. This is also a measure which has to be coordinated at the European level, because if some countries do have this kind of minimum uh, income and others do not have, well, there are also consequences of these uh, uh, disparities. So I think uh, it's important to uh, work on this uh, framework, uh, because uh, this is uh, uh, the cause of, uh, of despair, uh, as. Uh, uh, as uh, the director of your fund has mentioned, and I have, I indeed have looked at uh, the study which has been done. And we have to come out of this situation of despair, of hopelessness, because we cannot have a good recovery if people have not confidence in the future. Because people finally, they are making the recovery. If consumers say, no, I won't consume because I'm not sure uh, uh, if I can keep my job, if I have an income, if my kids uh, have a perspective to get a job afterwards. Well, uh, we will go for a long uh, stagnation in our economy with high, very high unemployment. So we have to restore the confidence of people as, and the confidence of people depends on the confidence of companies and the confidence of companies depend also on the confidence of the consumers. So I think this is uh, the issue of the recovery plan. Um, we have another question from Alan Barrett, Director of the Economic and Social Research Institute here in Ireland. And he says, we used to associate EU funding with major infrastructural projects like roads. Is there a case that the EU should now focus on digital projects 
post-COVID to ensure that all parts of the EU and all people are connected to strong broadband needed for work, plus so much else? Well, <laughs> uh, a very good question. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as I said, we, uh, we have as, a, as one of our priorities the, 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 the digital development of Europe. And there are uh, certainly there are technical aspects, there are infrastructure aspects, because not every part in Europe is well connected. Uh, we are now talking about uh, 5G, uh, but some uh, regions in Europe are not yet uh, even uh, at the level of 4G. So we, we really have uh, first uh, to, to make sure that uh, there is no area in Europe which is cut off or which has not uh, the right uh, infrastructure. But the second divide is the social divide. Uh, we have about 40% of uh, people in, uh, in, uh, in the European Union which have no or very, very low digital competencies, skills. Though we know that more or less 90% of jobs and probably more in the future, so 100%, in the future they need at least a certain level of digital skills. So there is a, a divide also in terms of uh, digital skills which, uh, uh, which has a risk of exclusion, because if you do not have the digital skills, well, it becomes more and more difficult to find a job and to, uh, and, and, and to find a job. There is even a, a gender di divide in digital skills, because we notice that many uh, women and, and young, uh, young women, um, well, the digital world is a very uh, male world. So we have to make sure also here a better balance, gender balance, in the, in the digital. So what is important is now investing certainly in, uh, in infrastructure, in technology, but at the end it's an investment also in people. Investing in skills of people, investing in their competencies uh, at all levels, especially also those who have a job and uh, whose job may change, be transformed uh, with a strong uh, digital content. We have to make sure that these people uh, uh, have the the right competences in the future to, to keep their job and to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be up to, to this technological evolution. And here Europe has to play a role. I, I talked about the skills agenda with a very strong digital component. I talked about the uh, skills pact uh, with uh, business uh, because business has also to participate in, to, uh, in, uh, in this uh, digital uh, uh, upskilling for everybody. So this is uh, uh, one of our big priorities. Thank you, Commissioner. I have another question from Tony Brown, who's a founding member and a senior fellow of the Institute. And he has um, a short question, but significant. Social policy has often been constrained by issues of competence and subsidiarity. What are the implications this time? Well, um, those who didn't like uh, social dimension uh, in Europe all, always referred to, uh, uh, well, Europe does not have any competence in the social field uh, uh, and social should be uh, left to the member states. That's a question of subsidiarity. I do not share that because this is a, a reading of the treaty which is certainly very limited because if you read the treaty, certainly uh, there is a sh uh, social is a shared competence. We have the possibility uh, in many uh, areas uh, to make proposals and this was done. Also the previous uh, commission uh, has really made important uh, proposals in the social field. I, I mentioned even if it's only a recommendation, but nevertheless on social protection. Uh, posting uh, has a very strong social component. Um, so uh, I think uh, nobody wants now uh, uh, to have uh, 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 the only competence uh, in social matters for Europe. Uh, it will remain a, a shared competence. But in an internal market, in a monetary union, you cannot just say everything is integrated. Monetary policy, we have a common monetary, unique monetary uh, competence. Uh, we have uh, uh, an internal market, but social that remains national. Uh, I think we have uh, to have also in the social field a level playing field. That's the discussion around, for instance, a framework for minimum wages. That's the discussion about we have to give all the employees the right uh, to collective bargaining. So 
Trade union rights are important in that, in that context. The right to be reskilled is important also in that context. So I think uh, this idea that social just is a subsidiarity uh, issue and we have to leave it only to member states doesn't fit into the uh, level of integration we have now in Europe. I think here also we need uh, stronger uh, social uh, coordination, certainly, but uh, also in some areas uh, we need uh, regulation and we have uh, to create a level playing field in the social area. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We have a question from Dr. Laura Banbrick, who's the social policy officer in ICTU, which is the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. And she goes back to referring to the, um, the remote working. And she says, should remote working materialize? How will the commission or the commission ensure the advantages for workers from working from home are not overshadowed by decent work challenges or inhibition? Yes, uh, well, we have seen through this crisis uh, the very rapid development of remote working. Uh, and in a way, this helped us to save a lot of jobs uh, because uh, people could continue working, though uh, everybody was locked down, but they, they could continue working. Now, there is, a, there is a, an agreement between social partners from uh, 2007 or six, I don't remember exactly, on remote working. But that was a period where the remote working was finally very marginal, very, not very important. And this was a, is an agreement between social partners, which normally had to be uh, adopted uh, by, uh, by all the member states. And I think now with a new evolution, we have to have a look, uh, how can we develop remote working, but how can we also take into account the advantages, but also the risks. I see that in some member states, just to quote France, social partners uh, will start now a discussion how to organize remote working, uh, given uh, the risks and the advantages. And I think here also we would need some kind of uh, uh, level playing field in, in, in Europe. And therefore, I, I, uh, I have already mentioned that I would like to invite social partners at European level to take up the uh, 2006 or 2007 agreement and to look what has to be changed, given that technology has changed, given that the uh, dimension of remote working has now increased dramatically, what can be done to give also at European level to every worker, uh, to every employee working uh, uh, this, in this way, uh, the, uh, the guarantees and uh, 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 because there's one aspect like uh, the right to disconnect, for instance. Huh? Everybody discuss, well, what is the difference between working time and and leisure time uh, in the digital in the digital uh, uh, in the digital area. Uh, so uh, all these issues have to be uh, discussed. But I would like social partners to start with that and to discuss them uh, as they did uh, uh, more than ten years ago. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, the next question we have um, is related to. Um, the single market, uh, and it's from Peter Gunning, uh, the NIIEA member, and he thanks you. Um, and it says, it looks like the movement of people for leisure and tourism for business and for business and for provision of services will be slow to resume. And even when resumed, may be less smooth than in the past. Is there a concern that there may be lasting damage to the single market? Well, uh, I think we, uh, I, I mentioned already the communication we have issued on tourism. Transport is certainly a, a, an important issue because uh, there, there are discussions now with uh, especially uh, uh, the, um, uh, the air, air uh, companies, uh, flights, uh, how to make flights uh, safe. Uh, I know that this is also something of interest for, for Ireland and for Irish companies. So uh, we will have uh, uh, in that uh, area, uh, the recovery will not be very fast, I think, because we, we still have risks because uh, the, the pandemic is not over. And, and what we are really scared of is a, a second wave. So there is the need uh, uh, for taking really real precaution. But at the same time, we have to make sure that uh, 
these sectors uh, are not excluded from recovery. So uh, uh, there has to be a balance between the health and safety issues and uh, restarting all these activities, uh, moving people around, uh, uh, traveling, uh, and also uh, tourism. Uh, in that sense, uh, free circulation is, is, remains. Uh, I, I spoke about the borders. Uh, I think we, we, are, uh, we, we, we also have issued a, a communication on reopening borders. And I think this can be, go faster. I think uh, closing borders is not a solution, even not for fighting the pandemic. But uh, so uh, this is something we, we have to be very keen on and, and to preserve the fundamental rights uh, of uh, the uh, internal market. And one of the fundamental rights is the free circulation of people. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, another question we have from Killian Rossi, the IIA economics researcher. And he said, thank you for your terrific presentation, Commissioner. What does the creation of the SURE instrument mean for the planned unemployment benefit reinsurance scheme uh, announced by President von der Leyen in her political guidelines? Well, the SURE instrument is a provisional uh, measure responding to the present crisis. So we managed to adopt it uh, now in a relatively short uh, time, uh, less than two months when the idea was launched. And now, as I said, uh, it uh, was definitely adopted uh, today, or, but formally it will be adopted uh, next Tuesday, I think, by, by, by the council. So this is a provisional uh, measure and it's also in, in the regulation, uh, it's limited in time. I think uh, two years. Well, it's a response to uh, especially the development of short-time work, uh, which is uh, uh, one of our major instruments to limit uh, uh, a massive increase in unemployment. But uh, that is not replacing uh, the other instrument, which is the unemployment benefit reinsurance system, which should be a permanent system in terms of uh, responding to uh, more uh, 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 crisis where in one or the other country uh, unemployment may go up due to different reasons. It's more based on uh, asymmetric shocks. Now we have more or less a symmetric shock, even if these, the consequences of the shocks is, is not even in, in all the member states, but the, 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 the unemployment insur insur reinsurance system should be more, uh, uh, should be permanent and should respond also to needs to one or the other countries. And this is uh, in, uh, uh, we are working on that. Uh, we have taken the commitment to come up with a proposal at the end of this year, and this will be respected, uh, but it's not uh, linked uh, to the SURE instrument. The SURE instrument is a response to this crisis. The permanent instrument should be uh, an instrument for future unemployment crisis and especially when one or the other country is more hit than the other, uh, to help them to maintain the level of their un unemployment benefits uh, as, as a social measure, but also in some way as an economic stabilizer. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a number of other questions and uh, I might put, put a couple of them together. From Martin Martinez Navarro, the Legal Secretary of the General Court of the EU in Luxembourg and Professor of Law at University Libre de Bruxelles, how will the recovery fund be financed with the emission of debt instruments by the Commission itself or with other own new resources? And how will the recovery fund be spent through grants or through repayable loans? Uh, that's rather one to keep. Uh, to keep. I, also from Ioana da Silva, dear Commissioner, a lot of member countries do not have the same digital skills as other countries. Will this not increase the remaining problem of brain drain, drain in Europe? Two rather different questions, Commissioner, if I could leave them. Um, Commissioner? Uh, Sorry. <laughs> First okay. question uh, on the recovery plan. It's a uh, work in progress, so I cannot be too uh, explicit on that. But certainly uh, uh, it will be uh, financed largely on uh, uh, on uh, loans taken by the European Union. <clears throat> but 
but uh, I think we should not exclude also the, crea <coughs> the creation of uh, new own resources. There, there is an ongoing discussion on, on this uh, uh, new own resources, and I think now it's the moment really uh, to make progress on that. And this will be part of a package. The European Parliament is very much insisting on new own resources. We have the uh, uh, fin financial trans uh, transaction tax. We have uh, some green taxes. So I think this is now the moment to, uh, to discuss that and also to find agreements on new uh, own resources. Now, grants and, and loans, this is in the discussion. I think we, we need both. Now, what is the proportion of grants? What is the proportion of loans? That will be the result of a difficult negotiation. Uh, now, I, I am convinced that we need, uh, especially also for the social aspects and the social investments, we need a, 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 a real um, important part of grants. Otherwise, it, it won't work. Uh, the second question, the, the digital divide, first we have to overcome the digital divide and therefore we have to support those countries where the level of digital is low. So we have really to support these countries to invest more in digital education, in new forms of digital training. There are a lot of new approaches how we can train people more rapidly in, uh, in, uh, in digital skills. Uh, brain drain is certainly not the solution because uh, we have to keep Europe together. We have to make sure that we have economic convergence and social convergence. So free movement is a good thing, right? But if uh, one uh, region or one uh, or part of Europe loses uh, the, the best skill, the most, uh, the best educated, the young people, the most, uh, those who want uh, want to be entrepreneurs, well, we, we lose the uh, convergence, uh, the economic convergence Europe absolutely needs. Thank you, Commissioner. We're approaching our uh, time, but perhaps um, with your permission, we could take one more question. It's quite a short one, and it's from Blair Horan, um, uh, who has a long history in the social um, area and he's an IIEA member. He says, how ambitious will the action plan on the social pillar be? I can only say very ambitious. Well, we are talking now, uh, as would be a bit my conclusion, a lot about resilience. I think this crisis has shown us that uh, uh, we have to make sure that our, our economies, but also our societies are more resilient, uh, are more able to, uh, to support and to react to shocks like the one we, we, are now, uh, we, we now have experienced. And I think uh, uh, resilience is also a, a matter of good social systems. Uh, those countries who have uh, managed quite well, not all, but because there are a few countries who have managed well where the social system are perhaps not so, full, but many countries have very strong health, good functioning health systems. So it's important to have a good functioning health system. Uh, but also uh, resilience means also good education systems. Uh, low levels of poverty. So I think that this uh, action plan is part of making Europe not only fairer, but also socially and in a way economically more resilient. So the, 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 uh, the uh, pillar of social rights have 20, has 20 principles and all of them, be it uh, gender equality, be it youth employment, be it health system, be it housing, all this is part of a more resilient, socially, but also economically resilient society. So we will work on that. We will be very ambitious. Not every issue is of com com pure competence of Europe, but we can help member states to improve their, their social situation. We uh, do that already now in the framework of the social scoreboard. We do it in the framework of the uh, country-specific recommendation. Uh, we have now adopted or integrated in our policy uh, the uh, principles of sustainability. And a lot of these principles are also referring to social issues, to social dimension. And therefore, I would say uh, this action plan uh, can have a strong impact. But to have a strong impact, 
it has to be ambitious. That means it has to respond to the expectations of our citizens, because I think people have high expectation that after this crisis, they are not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I must apologize to those questioners uh, who were, whom we did not uh, uh, reach because there was considerable interest. May I thank you, Commissioner, not only for your presentation, but for the generosity of your answers and the uh, sheer amount of information you have given us uh, in what the Commission is doing. I think we can see uh, your commitment to um, uh, bring forward um, the means to deal with this pandemic. And uh, we can wish you well in your work in this regard. And uh, I know that you will find our, our colleagues, our countrymen working with you uh, to try to get through this, uh, this dreadful pandemic. Thank you again, Commissioner, and thank you to those who have been listening to us. We have several more webinars uh, next week in the IIEA, and we hope you'll join us for that. But thank you again, Commissioner, and our good wishes. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to have these exchanges uh, with you and all those who participated in this, uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you again.